So last time in our study with First Thessalonians, uh, we we looked upon the we looked upon the rapture, and we looked upon the time when when we will be able to be with Christ for eternity. And we looked upon this rapture, and we study how this future event impacts the way we view death today. And to recap this, the, the rapture is a, is a day when all the saints, both dead and alive, are already taken up to join with Christ. And as we're taken up to be joined with Christ, we will be given new, resurrected, glorified bodies. That is, bodies that are free from sin. And we look forward to that day. And tonight, as as we continue our studies through 1 Thessalonians, we're going to look upon another future event. And tonight, we'll be looking upon the day of the Lord. And what we'll see in this message is that the day of the Lord is, is is a term repeated in Scripture from the Old Testament and New Testament. It's a term that speaks of the coming day of judgment against this world. And, and Paul here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he speaks about the day of the Lord, but he actually doesn't get in depth into it. And so in order to provide better context for what Paul is referring to, we must examine the rest of Scripture. And so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to take some time to, to talk about the day of the Lord. And I'll provide context for what Paul means by this term. And, and what does scripture talk about when it speaks the day of the Lord? And, and next time when we meet up for IT, we're going to look at part two of this message. Because this entire passage actually goes from verse one to, to verse, what was it, 11, I believe. And, and it's, there's just a lot to cover there. And so, and so tonight we're going to focus on building the context, building the context of what does the day of the Lord mean. And then next time, two weeks from now, when we meet again, uh, I'll go ahead and talk about the application. What does this term mean for us as believers? And so what I want to emphasize tonight is this. The gospel indeed is good news. But it is good news because there is bad news pending in the, new, in the near future. God saves us because we need to be saved from something. And typically when we think about saving, we we think of these, you know, Marvel superheroes saving people from, you know, external um, extraterrestrial threats. But here in God's story, in scripture, in the reality of this world that God has created and is in complete control of, What we need saving from is from God himself. And we must always remember this. We must always remember that we are dealing with a righteous, holy, and just God. He must condemn what is wicked in his eyes. If he doesn't, then this God cannot be holy and cannot be good. I mean, just think for, think about how in scripture, Whenever God reveals himself, people, men, just cower in fear. Moses cowered, shrink back, hid his face before the voice of God. Isaiah, the prophet, trembled before the throne of God. And even the disciples, Peter, James, and John, they fell on their face when Jesus revealed his transcendent glory. The reason being is because we are not worthy to be before God. We are sinners who deserve condemnation. That, that is the utter holiness of God. Consider for a moment how fear drives this world today. Fear, fear, you know, drives people to panic. It, 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 drives, it drives how people make decisions. It's the reason why the stock market crashed when the pandemic hit us. Fear presents itself in how we take care of our bodies. Right? We, we work out, we, 
we exercise in fear that our bodies might become frail in the future. We, fear drives in how we make career decisions and how we carry ourselves in public. Everyone is afraid of something or someone. The question we must be asking as Christians is do you fear God? Tonight we will see why we should. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we will be looking upon the day of the Lord, we'll be looking upon this future event and how this future event drives our present, night, our present lives. And, and as I mentioned, we'll be splitting this into two parts, verses 1 through 3 and then verses 4 to 7. And tonight, as we talk about the day of the Lord, we're going to focus upon what this means and how this impacts particularly unbelievers, people who do not know Christ, people who aren't part of the church. And we will find then in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, three reasons why all people, all people should respond to the gospel today and follow Christ. And so, you have your Bibles. Let's go ahead and take a look at this passage. Just three verses. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. This here is God's word. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. First point that we're going to see here, first reason why, the first reason why all people should respond to the gospel is because the day of the Lord is an unknown day. And, and Paul here, is, he's answering a question. He's answering a question that the Thessalonians have about the end times. And we saw in the previous passage last time, in, in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, that the Thessalonians were confused about the future times. Uh, and they were confused about the nature of the rapture. They, when they thought about the rapture, they thought that the saints who passed away, they were going to miss the coming of Christ. And perhaps they have a misunderstanding about the rapture because they have a misunderstanding about the day of the Lord. They thought that this day, the day of the Lord was coming soon. And in fact, this, this future event, this day of the Lord must have been pressing upon their minds. I mean, have you ever had a big event that you just were anticipating either in eagerness or in dread and it just hung over you? I remember, you know, I, I remember talking to a friend, a good friend was growing up and, and he had this basketball championship game coming up. And he would tell me throughout this whole week before that game, every night he was dreaming a different ending to that game. Just hung upon him. And so for these Thessalonians, these Thessalonians, they, they, were, they were facing persecution. From, from their city, from their neighbors. And, and they were facing hardships in their daily lives. And, and they must have thought, the persecution must have been so tough that they thought their suffering was a sign that the day of the Lord was going to arrive soon. And perhaps this is why Paul then exhorted them to be faithful, to remain faithful, and to work hard. Because they, if you thought that the day of the Lord was going to happen tomorrow, right? if, you, if you thought that, would you still care to go to work? Would you still care to study for your next exam? Probably not. And, and so in order to encourage these Thessalonians not to be lazy, not to just suddenly be idle, but to continue to be faithful, faithful in their labor of love to one another and to all people, Paul here writes about this future event. He writes here, starting in verse 1, concerning the times and the seasons. Concerning the times and the seasons. This here is a generic Greek phrase. 
speaking about some undefined period of time in the future. And within this context, we're, we're talking here about the day of the Lord is some unknown, undefined period of time that's in the future. Jesus, Jesus himself spoke about the day, about this day in a similar, like mysterious, just veiled way. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 to 37, Jesus says, But concerning that day or an hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming, the Son of Man. The point is this. There is a day of reckoning coming. And that time has not come yet. Nor do we know when that day will come. We just, we don't know. It's been kept hidden from us. I mean, if the, if the Lakers lose tonight, then they might as well just come tomorrow. But we just don't know. We don't know when it's going to come. How many times have you tried to keep something a secret? Like planning a surprise party. Just think about this for a moment. It, you know, it's, it's difficult to plan a surprise party. And yet, for man, it's still doable. If human beings can keep secrets from one another, just consider how much more God can keep this a secret from us. It's exactly because God keeps this day a secret. It's, it's why studying the future times for us is so difficult. We spend so much time trying to understand the signs of what's going to happen. We're trying to look around and say, is all this happening right now? And we just don't know. And we don't know because it is vague for a reason. God has chosen not to reveal the, the details of this day to us just yet. But that shouldn't discourage us from studying the scriptures as it relates to the end times. We may not know when this day of the Lord is, but we know, but we know that this day is coming and we should be well prepared for it. And, and while, while this day is coming, we, we have to think for a moment and just consider scripture and, and think about, okay, what, can, what does this day consist of? What is exactly the day of the Lord? What does scripture say about this? What is Paul referring to here? And so what I'm going to do is I, I, I'm going to take some time and actually go through scripture and, and look upon this. And this leads into our second point. We're going to look upon this unexpected day. We're going to look upon this unexpected day and we're going to ask ourselves, what is this day? The day of the Lord, it's an Old Testament term. Old Testament term, it's, it's typically used to refer to a day of judgment. For example, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel and with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners within it. It is a grim picture, a, a, a sad picture. A dark picture of what will happen when the day of the Lord arrives. The day of the Lord is God's judgment upon the evil in this world. This coming wrath. The Old Testament prophets proclaim this. They, they, they testify to the day of the Lord in order to remind Israel that God will vindicate his name. God will bring judgment upon sinners. All sinners are rebels, enemies of the Lord. The type of destruction that God will cast upon this world is none like anyone has ever seen before. The book of Joel, book of Joel speaks. The main theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. And in Joel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, we will see this, how Joel speaks about this destruction against the world. It says, Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. 
a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is a spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people, their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. You see here, the day of the Lord is it's a day when God will come and judge this world. But scripture, scripture also speaks about the day of the Lord for for those who do believe, for God's chosen people, there will be a day of salvation. In the same book of Joel, he says this to the people who are part of God's people. He says, in chapter 2, verse 30 to 32, And I will show wonders in heaven and on earth, blood, fire, and columns smoke, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now when we come to the New Testament, this exact phrase, the day of the Lord, is, is used four times. It's used in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, in our passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, and in 2 Peter verse th- chapter 3, verse 10. And, and, and as it's used these, t- these four times, the specific term, the day of the Lord, there's actually other references in the New Testament that speaks about a day in the future when Christ will come back and destruction will fall. And he, they refer to this as the day or the day of Jesus, the coming of Jesus. For example, when we look at Matthew chapter 24, in Matthew chapter 24, as I, I quoted from this a little bit earlier, we will, we will see here that Jesus speaks about a day that no one knows but God. And he speaks about a day in Noah's time. He, or he compares the day of the Lord to the day in Noah's time, the day when God cast a flood that devastated the entire world. And the only people who were saved was Noah and his family and, and all those who were on the ark. The emphasis here is that no one, no one during Noah's time prepared for the day that the flood came except for Noah, who believed in God. And so in the same way, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verse 38 to 39, Jesus says this. He says, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. And so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now we know this to be speaking about the day of the Lord because when we look at Second Peter now, turn me to Second Peter, we will see that the same reference of Noah in the day of the flood is connected to the day of the Lord. In the second Peter chapter three, verses five to seven, it says this for they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens exist long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So Peter is talking about the flood, right? And then he says but by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. What Peter here is saying is that the same way that God has casted the flood upon the world during Noah's time, there is a day waiting in the future where it won't be destroyed by water, it will be destroyed by fire day of judgment and we know this to be the day of the lord because if we look then down at verse 10 of second peter chapter 3 peter writes but the day of the lord 
will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So what we see here is that this day of the Lord is is this utter destruction that's prepared. Prepared to cast judgment upon all the sin and the wickedness and the evil in this world. And again, we, we do not know when this day will come, but it's worth it for us to think about what this day may look like and we anticipate it, prepare for it, so that we are not caught off guard. Now, now speaking about the end times, Speaking about in the broad scope of theology, while we don't know the specific day and date of when the day of the Lord will come, we can still think about, consider where does the day of the Lord fall in our understanding about the end times. And again, like last time, as I talked about the rapture and where the rapture fell, this will largely depend, depend upon your theological framework. And that being said, I, I, I can't, Actually, get into the details of, of all this because there's a lot to cover in that sense. But I encourage you to study the end times because scripture talks about it a lot. The whole book was based on it in Revelation. And I encourage you to study and come to your own conviction. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I understand the day of the Lord and where it falls in the broad scope of eschatology. And then we're going to pull up the slide that contains a, a I guess, a, a graph, a, a drawing that I, I made last time. And, and I'm speaking from a premillennial view, right? Meaning I believe there is a future judgment coming, that all this is a future event. And so, and so I'm speaking from this view, right? I believe that the tribulation, the millennial kingdom, the new heaven, new earth is all waiting for us in the future. And what that means though, what that means is that there is there is something worse coming, right? We, we think right now, man, this pandemic is crazy, but I, I believe that there is something worse coming based on my understanding of scripture. And in this view, the day of the Lord then, there's three places where the day of the Lord may happen in this view. It may happen either before the tribulation, after the tribulation, or after the millennial kingdom. And in fact, when you, when you, if you do a broad study of how different scholars interpret the day of the Lord, many of them actually would split the day up as if it's not talking about a singular day, but an event. Um, and and they'll, they'll say it'll span over two or, or even through all three of these points that's being pointed out here. And, and again, there's, there's good reasons. They have good arguments of why they say that. But I just can't get into detail of that. And so maybe, I don't know, in the future, if we have Sunday school again, we'll, we can do a whole curriculum on, on eschatology and we can talk about all this stuff in more, in more detail. Instead, I'm just going to go ahead and, and say, I believe, I believe that the day of the Lord falls after the tribulation period. So the day of the Lord, I believe the day of the Lord falls after the tribulation period. And the reason why I believe this is, is, is because of 2 Thessalonians. You return with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul here writes this. He says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed in the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. It seems to me pretty clearly in, in these two verses that this man of lawlessness this man of lawlessness that's supposed to come before the day of the Lord is the Antichrist. 
and this the same antichrist that's described in revelation chapter 13. we don't need to turn there but if you read revelation chapter 13 you'll you'll see a beast that comes out that deceives the nation to worship it and so and so if this man of lawlessness is the same beast that appears in revelation 13 revelation 13 is right in the middle of the explanation of the great tribulation that's happening on earth. So that means that the man of lawlessness must come first before the day of the Lord. And if the, and if the man of lawlessness comes during this great tribulation period, that means the day of the Lord must be after the tribulation. So that's, that's why I take it that the day of the Lord comes after the great tribulation but before the millennial kingdom now after studying this passage i, I realized I, I was i was i was actually really um what's the right word my 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 understanding of the rapture actually had to change i was tangled up in my thoughts and, and i was and i was wrestling with this a lot and so I actually want to just kind of explain my, my, what, what I was going through. Uh, last time when I taught upon the rapture, I said the rapture, what came before the tribulation. And now after studying all of this, the day of the Lord, I, I, I want to change that view. I actually don't think that's when the rapture will happen anymore. And, and again, it's a small point, but I just, I just want to just show you what my, how I'm thinking through all this. And, and I'm still learning as well. And, and I'm, I'm hope that, this would just be encouraging for you to really study the word of God for yourself. You know, when, when Paul here speaks about the man of lawlessness, he speaks about the man of lawlessness and he warns the Thessalonians here in 2 Thessalonians about this man of lawlessness that's going to come. It's going to come. It seems pretty clear to me that the church here is present. That the church here is present during this, this sign before the day of the Lord comes. And so if I take that the man of law is going to come during a great tribulation and the church is still there, present during this time, then that means the church hasn't been raptured yet. And so if the man of law appears during this time and then the day of the Lord comes, and I believe the rapture should happen before the day of the Lord, then I most likely will now, t I, I take now the view that the rapture most likely comes either in, in the middle of the tribulation or after the tribulation, right before the day of the Lord. I just, it's just hard for me to see it happening now before the tribulation because of how I understand how scripture describes the day of the Lord. And, and, and in saying all that, in saying all that, I just want to, I just want just to encourage you guys that changing my view on all this, you know, timing stuff doesn't mean I have to like re-preach my sermon all of a sudden. It's a small change, but the practical application of what I taught on last time still remains. The day of judgment is coming. The day of judgment is coming, but on that day, the saints are spared by the grace of God. And so we're talking about here details that doesn't change our entire view of Scripture or of God or of the end times. Again, we're, we're dealing with a portion of Scripture that God has chosen to make, to, to reveal to us in symbolic language. And so the meaning behind them are vague for a reason. And, and if you think about it, Israel had to deal with this throughout the Old Testament. Right, God constantly spoke about a Savior that will come, and Israel just doesn't know what God was talking about. And they struggled to figure out who the Savior was going to be. And when Jesus Christ actually came to earth, Israel didn't recognize him. And so, in a, in a similar way, we are, we are told here just to trust in God. Trusting God in his timing to fulfill his promises here. That though we don't fully understand the future, we trust that God here has a plan. We read that God has a plan and we firmly place our hope in the God who has a plan. Coming back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
looking on verse 2. Paul here, chapter 5, verse 2, he says that you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We are to be fully aware, meaning we shouldn't neglect the study of the end times. We shouldn't shrug it off as if it's just, you know, quote unquote, secondary doctrine. It's not. It's essential to understanding God's plan of salvation. It's essential to understanding why we have hope. We must be fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Meaning, we, we understand that the day of the Lord is coming, but like a thief. A thief comes in the night unexpectedly. It's an unexpected day. Right? If we knew exactly when the thief would come, we would, be, we would just set up our security protocols for that night, waiting, anticipating for that thief. But thieves show up unannounced. Without warning, they're a surprise. And so what Paul here is saying is that we must not be caught off guard. It will come, the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly, but we will not be unprepared. Right? And, and, and we, we understand this. We, we do this ourselves in our everyday lives. Right, us being in California, we're always talking about the big earthquake that's going to hit. We don't know when, but in the meantime, we prepare an emergency pack, and we have these small tremors here and there just to remind us that a big one is coming. We must be prepared. And as we continue to look in our passage, we reach verse 3. In verse 3, we will see here this unrelenting disaster that comes with the day of the Lord. In verse 3, Paul here writes, While people are, are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Let us again make note of the suddenness of this day. Uh, the, the labor pains will come, birth pains will come, right? right? Pregnant women, they, they know that one day they'll have to give birth, but that, and that pain will be great. But even though doctors give them an estimation due date, that labor pain can come early, it can come late. We don't know. We can't ultimately predict it, but when they do come, there will be great pain. And I'm just going to leave that metaphor there because I'll get in trouble if I take any further. Let us, let us consider what Paul here is talking about. Again, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 24. It's, it's just a key passage. Matthew, Matthew 24 is a key passage that continues to speak and give us more color to what this day of the Lord is about. In Matthew 24, verse 40 to 42, Jesus says this, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one is left. Two women will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Uh, sorry. And two women will, are, will be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. We, we see here how normal life is. And two men working the field, two women tending the mill. This is everyday life. And, and you think when you're, when you're living this kind of life, you think there is peace and security. And then at a snap of a finger, one is gone. The other remains. Right? There's, some will say there's now balance in this world. Now, I don't know if, if you know, we, when we read this text, we've got to be careful. Because I, I think when we read this text, we think the one who's taken away must be the one who's rapturing. And the text actually doesn't specify, you know, which one is unbeliever and which one is the believer. So, so we don't know which one's which here. But what we do know about this text is that God's judgment has come upon the world. God's judgment has arrived. 
And this is the sobering reality that we all live in. This world will face its end, but its end, its end will not be caused by global warming. Its end will not be caused by some asteroid in space. Its, its end will not be caused by a nuclear war. The end of the world will come in the wrath of God pouring out against all sinners. Again, back in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, look at this last phrase. They will not escape. In the Greek here, it's, it's emphasized. They will not escape. There's absolutely no hope of escaping the coming wrath of God. In other words, the future awareness that we all must have here, future awareness of this day of the Lord, it reminds us that we live in God's world, but not ours. This is God's world. He will get the glory. God will either be glorified in his judgment against evil and sin, or God will be glorified in his grace towards those who believe and repent. Church, look upon the people around you. I mean, I know there might not be anyone around you right now, but, but, but just think about the people in your lives. Think about them with great compassion. I mean, just to, to see people, your friends, your family, and then to see these, all of them just pursue the world as if it's their peace and security, that should bring you pain. Because this world cannot offer such peace and security. This world cannot offer them escape. All sinners are destined to judgment. That, that is a promise from God. And so the big idea for tonight then is this, that the coming wrath of God is a warning for you to respond to the call to gospel and follow Christ today. And, and if you're with us tonight, if you're with us tonight, you're an unbeliever. Uh, you know, first of all, welcome. And, and you may hear me speaking tonight. You may be hearing this message. And you'll be thinking to yourself, this, why would I believe in such a God? Why would I want to believe in a wrathful God? Well, well let, me, let me go ahead and ask you this. Do you not want to believe in a wrathful God just because he's wrathful? wrathful? Or are you scared that if God is indeed truly angry at your sin, you realize that you have no escape? You realize and you too deserve condemnation. Let us consider this. God indeed is wrathful. But his wrath can be appeased. John 3.16, the famous verse, tells us that God so loved this wicked world that he was willing to send his only son to die on the cross. So that whoever so believe will be saved. And on that cross, Jesus Christ bore the full wrath of God. Of, he bore your sins. If you believe this and repent of your sins, you will be saved. You see here, when we're talking about Christianity, Christianity is not about just saving you from your you know, present guilt and shame. The gospel is not just some kind of feel-good story. We don't just say this so that we can live a, you know, just a happy, smiley life. We don't do it just to make us feel better about ourselves. No, what, we, well, what the gospel here is telling us is that what Christ did on the cross, when Christ died, that had eternal value. 
Jesus died to save you from the full wrath of God that will be revealed at the day of the Lord. And as for the church, as for us Christians, we have a great task before us. If this is the future God has promised, we must remember our mission. We are to bring the gospel to the ends of the world. We have to warn the people of destruction that there is indeed condemnation waiting upon them. We must reveal to them the hope of salvation that is only found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me then ask you, how do you live your life? What do you pursue in this world? What choices do you make? We are supposedly to be the church, God's people, light in this world of darkness. We carry with us the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have hope on our side. Do you live as one who has such transcendent hope? In other words, when people look upon you and they, they wonder why you work so hard at your job, they look upon you and they ask you, why do you care so much about your family? They look upon you and they wonder, why don't you cheat on your taxes? Why are you always so friendly, kind, and selfless? When people ask you about who you are, do they see Christian hope? Do they see that? Do they see that your peace and security, that what drives you, what you're afraid of, what your fear, the fear comes from God. Peace and security comes from God. Your hope comes from God. Our awareness of the future should impact our present lives. And our present life should speak volumes about our future perspective. So live as one who has a transcendent hope. Live as one who understands that Jesus may come back tomorrow and judgment may fall upon this earth. Live as one who desires to see people saved today. Not tomorrow, not sometime in the future, but now. Live, live in a way that proclaims hope to this world. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time where we are to gather together. And as we read the sobering reality of your word, may we be reminded, may we be reminded of the hope that we have in you. Lord, let us take scripture for what it says. For scripture tells us that there is a day coming, a day coming where judgment will fall. Let us, Lord, look to that day with just great compassion for the people around us. Let us be prepared for that day, to be reminded that this is why we believe, this is what we are saved from. Oh, Lord. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you sacrificed your son on the cross. We thank you, even right now, that the day of the Lord hasn't come yet. Because then that means we can still proclaim the gospel. But Lord, we know it's coming. And on that day, it will be glorious. On that day, you will be vindicated. On that day, your name will be praised. So, God, let us continue to live with an eye upon the future, with our feet in the present, and our hearts and our mind continue, continually looking to glorify your name. In all that we do, we bring glory to you. Be with us in our discussion. Be with us as we continue to live out our lives every day for you. I pray all this in your name. Amen.